morning. Great worship set, Pastor Mark, wherever he ran off to. Hello, church. I'm so glad that you're here this morning, um, perhaps with fuel price disruptions and flight disruptions, you decided to take a staycation and stay here, and I'm so glad you're here with me. Pastor Jason is in Uganda. In fact, about eight or nine hours ago, he preached in a church there, so they've heard a sermon from him, you get me. Well, I hope by the end of this morning, you'll be glad you're here. You'll be glad you did. We are in a sermon series called Fruition. It's a focus on the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and we were at fruit number five of nine, right smack dab in the middle. And if you look at the bell chart on the slide, there you go, that's a bell curve, you'll see that fruit number five, kindness, is at the peak. So yeah, love, joy, peace, patience, good, but kindness, we'll see why. That's at the top. And then you'll feel sad for those who couldn't be here this morning and who couldn't stream because I'll miss this message. You're going to want to encourage them. Go, you got to go listen to this. I'll tell you a few reasons why. This passage is going to debunk a popular idiom. Uh, You'll still think about it, but now you'll think about it in a better way, in a biblical way. And you'll learn a new word this morning and a new food and one that's gonna be perfect for your 4th of July picnic that you're having tomorrow, right? And then you're gonna see Pastor Mark, he's gonna be feverishly trying to write new music on kindness, something from like the 18th century Brahms-like or something that uh, guitarist Phil Green could play. So he'll be working on that. Mark, do you need a pen? Where are you? Okay, never mind. Hopefully, most of all, you're going to see how kindness is at the center of the church's most important mission. So here's the big thought for this morning, and we'll unpack it. The maturing fruit of kindness strengthens the love and witness of the church and opens doors for the life-changing gospel. Let's look at our passage this morning. We've been looking at Galatians chapter 5. You can turn there in your Bible. If you don't have one, there's one in the pew right in front of you. Please feel free, if you don't have a Bible, to take that with you. So Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. And as we read this, I want you to pay particular attention to the active work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay? Galatians 5, beginning verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That walk, that's going to become important in just a minute. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for those are opposed to one another, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's a long list, and yet there's more. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, that's our salvation, as the Spirit convicted us of the truth of the gospel. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step, behave in accordance with the Spirit. That's our passage for this morning. We're going to walk through part of that and go elsewhere as well. So we all know that tomorrow, what is it, July 4th? It's Independence Day. 
It's so significant that we don't just call it July 4th. We call it the 4th of July, right? We don't say the 26th of April. We don't say the 17th of September. We say the 4th of July. But you know, there's a day for everything. Today, July 3rd, if you didn't know, is National Fried Clam Day. It's also National Eat, Eat Your Beans Day. Sounds like something a parent would say to their children. Eat your vegetables because it's National Eat Your Vegetables Day. Eat your beans. It's also, this is a great one, National Chocolate Wafers Day. Have I got you prepped to run to H-E-B right after the service this morning? Yeah. Well, I don't know who picks them, but there's a day for everything. Did you know that there's a National Random Acts of Kindness Day? Yes. Uh, according to the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation, they set the Random Act of Kindness Day, and it happened this year on February 17th. What's more, it was also Random Acts of Kindness Week. They put the whole week together, February 12th through 18th. Well, we missed that one. Ironic, though, if you think about it, that Random Acts of Kindness has a specific calendar date. That doesn't sound very random, doesn't it? It's like spontaneity has its time and place. Randomness has its time and place. Doesn't sound that random. But here's the goal of this what the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation did. They want to make kindness the norm. They want you and I to imagine a world where kindness is the norm and then accomplish this through kindness intention, random intention of that practice. It's a really noble idea. It's a great thought. But accomplishing the goal of world changing, which is what they want to do, change the world, through human intentions and just random actions is sadly, in my opinion, doomed to fail. Uh, we may randomly and spontaneously do acts of kindness. You may let someone in front of you in line. You may, someone's coming through a drive through and you pay for what they're, or someone, you pay for what somebody behind you is, is gonna get. I had that happen to me recently. I was going through a drive through for coffee and I got up to the window, and they said, it's been paid for. And I thought, they probably saw my 1999 CRV and thought I couldn't afford a cup of coffee. How nice was that? You may um, do some household chores for your mom as a random act, right? You may take a plate of cookies to a neighbor just randomly. Those are all very kind things. But it's not really world-changing. It's not even you changing. You see, the Holy Spirit's fruit of kindness is deeper than random acts. Acts are good. But it speaks really of the internal character of kindness, the disposition of kindness, something that becomes more part of your nature. And it's evidenced through kind thoughts and kind words and kind actions. To grasp this, I want to step back to the beginning of our passage in Galatians 5, verse 16. Here's what Paul wrote. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. That word walk, very important to understand. I'm going to take you back to the word in its original language, and show you why. And at the same time, I might make you kind of hungry. I've done that a little bit, but even, even perhaps more right now. You see, I want you to remember this word anytime that you read this passage or anytime you see the word walk by the Spirit in the Scriptures. It's in the New Testament a number of times. The word for walk is peripatete. It comes from the word peripateo. Add another T in there, and it sounds like this. Peri potato. Say that with me. Peri potato. Let's do it together. Peri potato. Okay, didn't get much of a response there. 
It's okay, you'll catch up. So here's a picture of a real food called peri peri potatoes. It's a Portuguese dish. It's roasted potatoes with peri peri sauce, peri peri seasoning. And let me explain what this is made of. You're going to love this, right? Uh, peri peri seasoning is a blend of spices and herbs, including paprika, onion and garlic powder, cayenne, ginger, coriander, oregano, and parsley with a little sugar. It's delicious, not only on roasted potatoes, but it's great rubbed on chicken and steaks. So there you go. Anybody ever hear of peri-peri potatoes before? Nope. Oh, Clay Aston. Okay. <laughs> Guess we're going tomorrow for our 4th of July picnic to the Astons. <laughs> They'll have it on their table. So peri pateo. Let me go to the, the, the Greek word and explain what, how, why that matters. Peri pateo. What that means is to walk about, to conduct your life, to follow, to listen, to obey, while letting the Holy Spirit progressively beckon you to kindness or the other fruits and actually change you so the fruits become growing and active in you. And this applies to every one of the nine fruits. It's at the beginning of that passage. So if you think of all the fruits, here's um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Spirit's work is not simply to guide you to random acts of love or random acts of gentleness or randomly self-control, but actually to steer you into change, to change your inner character so you have a maturing, maturing disposition in each of these nine fruits of the Spirit as he's growing them in you. They become part of your daily walk. So the fruit of kindness, let's go there specifically. Here's the biblical concept. The kindness of God, which is life-giving, is produced in us by the Holy Spirit in us, changing our very nature, our very heart, our very outlook on life and outlook on those around us that we encounter. That's the concept. And it opened doors for the life-changing gospel, right? And it strengthens us as a church family in our love for one another, in our kindness to one another, so that we become a stronger witness for the gospel when people see us, when they come among us. To say it simply, the Holy Spirit intends to grow inside of us the character of kindness so that we will have a disposition that we bear in our daily walk, our daily peri pateo, and our encounter with people. And this is important. It's not simply saying and doing kind things. No, it's much more powerful and much more intentional than that because it reflects the kindness of God. And I want to take you there and help you see how the kindness of God connects to the gospel. So back in the Old Testament, Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. But that word also has a broader meaning. It also means taste and see that the Lord is kind. You see, God is kind. And God's kindness is not random. Kindness is in his eternal, unchanging nature. God doesn't suddenly act in a kind way. Kindness is part of who God is eternally in his nature. And since God is kind, is eternal and unchanging nature, since God created the world with humanity as the pinnacle of his creation, God exp expresses his kindness to everyone. Everyone who has lived, everyone who lives now, everyone that's going to live, even if they're not aware of it. Kindness of God is expressed in his word. Kindness of God is expressed in creation. And kindness of God is expressed especially in his son, Jesus Christ. So again, big picture, hang with me, follow me. The kindness of God is directly linked to the gospel. The fulfillment of his plan for salvation and a right relationship with him for all eternity. We're going to see that in his word. 
to sinners who hate God or ignore God or claim to follow other gods or choose to be their own God, God is kind to them. The Bible says this directly. Let's listen for it. Here's Titus chapter 3. Remind them to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy towards all people. He's talking to believers. And then he reminds us of where we were when God was kind to us. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, pressing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, not because we acted good at some moments in life. We did good things. We made claims about ourselves. But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, here's the Holy Spirit coming, and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, he renewed us, gave us a new nature, made us new creatures when he saved us. Amen. Right? Restoring us back into his image in which he made us, whom he poured on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. See, think about our salvation. It would be one thing because we know God is patient. Scripture tells us that. He's long-suffering. It'd be one thing if God just said, I'm just going to let people do whatever they want to. I'm going to let them act in evil, ungodly ways. And when the time comes, they're all going to be judged. But no. His kindness. Because God is kind, he worked out salvation for us. Listen to this. Right? Here's Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in our offenses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Enemies of God we were, and he took us to that place through his kindness, his loving kindness. But when the goodness, uh, I'm sorry, um, so that in the coming ages he might show through all the people that have been saved, imagine in the end days when Christ returns and we see God's, how God has saved so many that we can't even count. He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus, what he's done for us, how kind he's been to us. For by grace you are saved through faith. Not your own doing, it's a gift of God. God continues, God continues, because kindness is in his nature, God continues to express his kindness with sinners, with his enemies, to lead them to repentance. Kindness to change a person from death to eternal life. Kindness to change the course of life of a sinner. Kindness to give those he's redeemed, an eternal purpose. We'll get there in a minute. Listen to this. He shows kindness. He shows patience with sinful humanity every day. That's kindness. Patience. He showed love by forgiving our sins through the death of Jesus Christ. That's kindness. He sent the Holy Spirit to sinners to call sinners to believe in his son, Jesus Christ. The work of the Spirit is to do that, to, to convict us of the gospel truth. That's kindness. He offered his enemies to become his children. That's kindness. He called on us, his children, to speak the gospel to others. That's kindness in us and in others. As you read the gospels, have you observed ways in which Jesus, God's son, showed kindness to people he encountered? He spent time with outcasts and sinners kindness. He fed hungry people, kindness. He healed people, the blind and the lame and the sick, kindness. He comforted people in distress, kindness. He prayed for forgiveness for the people who hung him on the cross to die. He's on the cross dying. Father, forgive them, kindness. 
Jesus, John's gospel says, was full of grace, representing the Father in his humanity when he took on human flesh. And he displayed God's kindness, as we've seen in a few examples, and in words and in actions, but these weren't just to address temporary conditions. Yes, he loves people. He loved them and expressed kindness to them, but even more so that sinners like you and me would hear the gospel as he preached it, would believe it, would receive salvation, free us from sin, change us, make us children of God the Father, his good and perfect Father, the good and perfect Father, and grant us a promise of eternal life. Jesus was intentional with his kindness because he cared about people, but he also wanted them to come to life in his name. Right? You see that the greater purpose of a kind disposition that expresses itself in words and actions? It's not simply to do a kind thing. It's got a greater purpose. And that's true about the kindness that the Holy Spirit is trying to cultivate in us. Listen, do you think the Holy Spirit's work to produce a fruit in kindness is any different than what we saw in Christ Jesus? He revealed the gospel of truth to save us. And now, present in us, his continuing work is this. His continuing work is to change us, change our nature and disposition. This is what he intends to do. If God's expression of kindness come from his eternal, unchanging nature, so too our expressions of kindness in thoughts, in words, and in deeds are to be consistently and intentionally practiced, not random, but they must come from the nature that the Holy Spirit is changing in us, what he's doing in us, so we can walk in the Spirit. We can be led by the Spirit. Uh, we can behave in accordance with the, what the Spirit is teaching us and showing us. But how? We're still sinful. <laughs> May in the image of God, though, we have kindness in our nature, but our nature's still broken. We expect kindness, but many times we don't act like it. We don't do it. We actually kind of do random acts. But that's not good enough. That's not spirit kindness fruit. So let's telescope back a little bit, All right? You see, the fruit of kindness is not random. It's development in our new nature, the one in which the Holy Spirit's working on. The kindness fruit is, represents a change in us, a growing disposition, a natural response to a person or a situation or a circumstance reflected in the response of kindness to a person, a response of kindness to a situation, a response of kindness to a circumstance, becoming part of our nature to think and speak and act with kindness as those opportunities are brought before us. So kindness, the Spirit's fruit of kindness in us is very intentional. Two things that we need to be thinking about. First, as kindness works among us, as kindness works among the family of Christ, the local church, it strengthens the love and witness of the church family. So people see not just individually, gosh, that's a really kind person. He sees us as kind. He sees kindness in us and from us, among ourselves, and then as kindness is expressed to those outside us, those who haven't believed in Christ, those who have not received salvation through what God did through his kindness, it opened doors for the life-changing gospel Let's look at the first one. Kindness to others inside the family of God strengthens the love and witness of the church family. Don't we want to be more like that? Don't we desire that? Here's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How would you grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Well, if you're not walking by the Spirit, if you're not led by the Spirit, if you're not listening to the Spirit and what he's calling us to be in the Word of God and allowing him to change us when we respond to him. 
He's the one who sealed us for the day of redemption. That was our salvation, but he's at work in us. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Sounds like the same practices described in Galatians 5, right? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Notice the recipients here in this passage. They aren't random. They're one another's. They're family members. They're the folks sitting right next to you in this sanctuary. Think about the impact of kindness on the reputation of our church family. Do you want those who don't believe in the gospel to be attracted to the gospel? What kind of influence and impact might kindness that is growing among us for one another have on those we hope to reach? When we show up at Movie in the Park to serve and people observe, oh my goodness, the kindness they have for one another and how they speak and how they're acting. Or they come in here on a Sunday morning, oh my gosh, the kindness. Or they visit a growth group, oh my goodness, the kindness, the kindness, right? Let's respond to the Holy Spirit's calling on us to cultivate his fruit of kindness. Ask for, pray for, um, if you have difficulty with somebody, pray that the Lord, the Holy Spirit helps you to have kind thoughts about them, kind words for them. In a short while this morning, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper. It's coming up. What a great day to be here. Take the Lord's Supper, right? The Bible calls us to do this in a worthy manner in 1 Corinthians 11. One specific aspect of worthy manner is our, relate, is our relationships with our church family, with one another here. So I'm asking you now to think about this as we get ready in a few minutes for that. Are your thoughts about your brothers and sisters kind thoughts? Is there anybody in our family that you don't have kind thoughts about? That you don't have kind words for when you see them? How about your actions? If you can't do it here with your brothers and sisters, how are you going to be able to do it with those outside the family who need the gospel? It begins with us, right? And then kindness opens the door for those outside the family of God, opens the door for the gospel. Listen to Colossians 3, and here's verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, put on the garments with a heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If someone happens to have a complaint against anyone else, that means when you see people that, are, that offend you, uh, that are angry at you, outside the family of God, uh, that act with malice towards you, that want to do you harm in some way, that speak ill about you, uh, that don't want to listen to you, what should your response be? Kindness. Love your enemies. Right? Love your enemies. Show them kindness. Don't let it dwell in your mind, but ask for, how do I think kindly about this person? What do I say kindly to them? What can I do for them that's kind? Clothe yourselves. I love that image. <laughs> it means every morning, put on the clothes. <laughs> you may be going to face a difficult conversation with somebody, put on the clothes. You may be unexpected by something that happens. Put on the clothes. Kindness. Let the Holy Spirit work on you to cultivate that disposition. And it's a maturing thing. You may not feel like, boy, I'm so far away from that right now, but it's a maturing thing. Put on the clothes. Begin thinking actively about the great impact that a kind disposition with kind thoughts that produces kind words and kind actions can have on someone who God, through his kindness, is trying to bring to salvation by the gospel. Think about that. I want to give you a story. This is so cool. Um, so back at 
when I was in, living in Chicago, the church I was going to, heard, heard a story about a woman, um, never met her, but this is a great story. She showed kindness to each of her neighbors. She truly cared about them. If they needed something, she took care of them. If they were sick, she went and visited them. I mean, she had that Christ-like disposition. She was be, being like Jesus to her, her neighbors all around her. The church had regular gospel Sundays where they announced ahead of time, this Sunday we're going to be preaching the gospel really clearly. So what she did, her kindness was very intentional because she knew their spiritual condition. That's important. The people that God puts in front of you know what their spiritual condition is. And so she invited them to church that Sunday, a Sunday where, where it was being preached. And this is so cool. She went in the sanctuary. She put little bulletins over a number of chairs because she knew how many people she had invited. Then she went up to the pastor and said, okay, pastor, I've done my job. You do yours. Isn't that incredible? Her acts of kindness were so intentional because she learned about their spiritual condition. She didn't feel really comfortable that she'd get the gospel right when she told them about it, but she knew that would happen in church, and she got them there. Her life of kindness, her disposition, was functioning for exactly what we talked about, opening doors for her neighbors to hear the gospel. Isn't that amazing? We listen to the words of Scripture we listen for how the Spirit teaches them to us. We pray. We think about the spiritual condition of the people that God has put in our life. And then God brings us into contact with people, into relationship with people. And we respond as the Holy Spirit cultivates kindness in us. So we can think kind thoughts. We can say kind words. We can do kind actions more naturally because that's the nature the Spirit is building in us to walk by him, to be led by him through the life that we have in him. Here's a suggestion for you. Talk about this at home with your spouse and with your children. Think about the people in your lives. Think about the kind words and acts that you can do for others in the family and outside the family. And it's not random if you're doing it with great intention. That's not random. You can do things, simple things, and begin a culture in your home, begin a culture among people that you're around who are believers for this, and watch how the Holy Spirit can use that. Because he's doing two things. He is convicting people of the truth of the gospel when they hear it. And he's cultivating in you the fruits, kindness, so that that can open up doors for people to hear, just like this amazing woman did. Not random. I encourage you, don't lose a moment here. 3rd of July. Let's walk this walk today. Let the 3rd of July be a beginning, a fresh beginning for us in our cultivation by the Holy Spirit of kindness, a fresh peri potato in the Spirit, all for Jesus. Amen? We're moving into the time of the Lord's Supper. If you're a baptized believer, you don't have the elements, please raise your hand. A deacon will bring them to you. I want you to take a moment in prayer and I want you to remember the kindness of God, the patience that God had in your life while he waited for you to be convicted by the Holy Spirit for your salvation. The gracious sending of his son, Jesus' kindness in giving his life so that your sins could be forgiven that supreme act of kindness. 
and the kindness of the Holy Spirit of convicting you of the truth of the gospel when you heard it and bringing you to this moment where we remember what Christ did for us. Let's take a moment and pray, all right? Father, we thank you so much for your kindness. We thank you for what your son did for us, gave his life on the cross, died to pay for our sins, what we deserved. That kindness of enacting the forgiveness of our sins by the simple confession of belief in his name and what he did. Father, we thank you for the kindness of giving us the Holy Spirit who's actively at work in us. And Father, this morning, as we take these elements, we remember your kindness, your son's kindness, Holy Spirit's kindness. When we take this, it's in remembrance of what Christ did and also remembrance that he's coming back. Father, we pray that we can be actively kind so that others would have the opportunity to hear the gospel and be right beside us taking these elements. Pray this in Christ's name, amen. So here's what Luke wrote in his gospel about this moment. Jesus did this with his disciples the night before he gave his life on the cross. And he said this to them. He took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I think with that remembrance of what he did for us, with thankfulness for his kindness. And likewise, the cup after they'd eaten. Jesus said, this cup is poured out for you in the new covenant of my blood. His blood shed for us and shed for those who need to hear the gospel for which he's given us the opportunity to open those doors. Father, we are thankful. Can't wait for your son to come back. Keep us, keep us focused, Lord, while we wait. Keep us focused on the mission that you have for us. Let our kindness be evidence of that. Amen.